Okay, this is part two in a video series about the effects of nitric oxide. Um, in the last series, we talked about how nitric oxide is um, something that increases in vitamin A toxicity and hypervitaminosis A because retinoids in general are mitochondrial toxicants. And um, I didn't mention in the previous video that one mechanism by which that happens is um, retinal aldehyde actually uh, binds to a phospholipid called phosphatidylethanolamine, making A2E. A2E is a lipofuscin. And um, so A2E is basically stealing a huge amount of phospholipids from the phospholipid membrane. So that alone can cause membrane instability. But also A2E has been shown to block the formation of cardiolipin. Cardiolipin is kind of has a lot of different purposes in a mitochondrial membrane. But one of them is kind of like sticky component, kind of holds all of these um, complexes in place that help to make ATP and help to get rid of free radical oxygen and turn it into water. Um, and so um, the A2E can actually um, block the that complex four that I was talking about in the previous um, video. And if you're wondering what this giant diagram is, this is my map. I've been mapping things out because it's how I can understand stuff as if I make a map. So now what is the nitric oxide doing to the methylation pathway? So what it is doing is it actually turns off methionine synthase, which is a B12 dependent enzyme, which also uses folate to make homocysteine into methionine. And when, it, when this happens, it recycles tetrahydrofolate. Um, and then if we need to make more 5-methylfolate, you can see we run this straight through here. And it's a B6-dependent enzyme here. Um, it's a serine, uh, serine hydroxymethyltransferase, if I'm remembering the names right. Um, and then that is able to go to 5,10-methylene tetrahydrofolate and then MTHFR, that famous enzyme that everybody wonders if they're, if they have a polymorphism in it, which is a good thing to wonder, by the way, um, MTHFR converts it back to 5-methylfolate. So we have this roundabout pathway that recycles over and over again. But when nitric oxide here comes in, and this can come from the urea cycle. Remember I said in the previous video that arginine could upregulate the production of nitric oxide. Um, and it, and it, so it comes in here, it blocks methionine synthase. And then what happens is your body has a backup pathway because it's gloriously made. So you have betaine hydroxymethyltransferase. I'm pretty sure I said that one right too. <laughs> and so forgive me if I'm saying things wrong because I have strep and I'm, my brain is not healthy right now, but I want to do this video. So um, so the betaine is, uh, becomes the methyl donor. So it's actually trimethylglycine. Tri meaning it has three methyl groups. So trimethylglycine becomes dimethylglycine and then that's converted to sarcosine and then sarcosine eventually becomes glycine. And so you can see that it would um, basically be helpful because then the glycine helps to convert um, or it can help SAM go to SA. So it's it's a whole pathway that's just kind of recycling over and over again. So betaine here is really important. So anytime your nitric oxide levels go up, whether it's because you're just in a tiny bit of oxidative stress at that moment in time, this pathway, this BHMT pathway, is upregulated in the kidneys and in the liver, and now they know it happens in the brain too. So it used to be they didn't think that was happening there, but in it's especially happening in models of multiple scler sclerosis. So we know that that because the betaine levels go low in the brain in multiple sclerosis, and so they're overutilizing this pathway. So, and that's likely because there's oxidative damage going on, right? So we're blocking this methionine synthase. Okay, so if you need betaine, where do you get it from? Well, you can get it from your diet. That's totally possible. You could get it from your diet. So betaine-rich foods are usually in uh, wheat bran, quinoa, beets. So where you run into the problem with a dietary betaine deficiency, it's usually because you're on a low oxalate diet, um, low oxalate diets wouldn't have those food in it, or potentially you're on a gluten-free diet. Gluten-free diets 
have very much less of those particular foods in them. Um, I mean, some, some things you use quinoa on gluten-free diets, like some cookies and stuff, but most of the time it's rice flour or corn starch or potato starch or tapioca flour. So it aren't, it's not things that are high in betaine. So most people on a gluten-free diet will have a betaine deficient diet, but no worries, right? Because you can make betaine, you can make betaine out of phosphatidylcholine. Where does that come from? It could come from dietary choline. So you could be eating eggs and that would be beneficial to this pathway, sort of. It helps, you need eggs. You need eggs, especially if you have vitamin A toxicity or in general, you need some um, type of, or source of choline because choline makes up all your membranes. We need healthy cell membranes. We need healthy cell membranes for our gut. We need it for our brains. So, um, so you could get it from dietary choline um, whether you get your phosphatidylcholine from that or from phosphatidylethanolamine, and remember this is being stolen a bit by vitamin A, wherever you get this from, you are going to convert it to betaine aldehyde and then from betaine aldehyde into betaine. And the enzyme that converts betaine aldehyde to betaine is ALDH7A1 and it's a moonlighting enzyme. So your body uses it in different places. For different reactions. So if we think about in a high oxidative stress environment where nitric oxide has gone up or free radicals have gone up and they're all inside the cell membranes, this ALDH7A1 does not, um, it's, it's not going to do its one of its primary important jobs and that's lysine metabolism. Okay. So there's two places that ALDH7A1 goes when there's a lot of stress in the body. One, it's gonna go towards making betaine because betaine is an osmotic regulator and it will help to keep the cells from imploding, exploding, that kind of stuff. Um, two, um, this ALDH7A1 will go to the lipid membranes to prevent oxidative damage as well. That's another moonlighting role that it has. So if it's doing these things for us, then it's not metabolizing lysine. And when it's not metabolizing lysine, what happens is you break down lysine in the wrong way and you build up a component called P6C. And P6C and the active form of, of B6 called pyridoxal 5-phosphate, they condense together or combine together and it causes an inactive form of B6. At the same time, you would see increases in pipicolic acid. And we see these increases in pipicolic acid, especially in liver failure. And that's for another video. It's just something to hold on to in your brain. Um, but this P6C, um, it's, it's a toxic byproduct that binds to um, your active form of B6 and it causes it to become inactive. And so that inactive inactivity of B6 continues into a cascade. Um, some of the signs of B6 deficiency are could actually be a functional B6 deficiency. So you would end up having um, things like histamine intolerance. Um, you might have problems with your skin like eczema because if you don't have enough B6, then you can't work delta-60 saturase. And so then if you don't get in your essential fatty acids, from your diet, you're not able to make those from the precursors. You won't be able to do um, some of the steps in like elongation, um, you know, you'll get stuck in that pathway. So um, also it typically would lead to hair falling out. So if you have alopecia, you potentially have a functional B6 deficiency. Also, if you are really pushing this pathway, making a lot of P6C, then um, probably when you take B6, you'll get a burning sensation. That's just my experience, my own personal experience, and also what I think is going on in B6 toxicity. I think we're seeing really high blood levels of B6 because people are taking it for their B6 deficiency, but what they're actually doing is having a large amount of inactive B6 in their body, and we don't really test for that in blood. So how would you know if you have a B6 deficiency, a functional one? Well, you would get labs drawn and what you'd be looking for is increases in sarcosine. Okay. So that means that you're pushing this BHMT pathway. 
If you have an increase in sarcosine, and then you could have any of the other, um, like you could have a high lysine level on your amino acid lab that could indicate that you have a functional B6 deficiency. Another one is 309. You don't see it here in this pathway, but 309 requires B6. And then another thing you can look for is a low taurine level. Because if you look here, if you have, um, if you have high levels of nitric oxide and you end up with a B6 deficiency as well, then you're not going to be able to run this CBS enzyme, um, cystathione B synthase. And that means you will not go from homocysteine to cystathionine. So you may have an elevated level of homocysteine, but I don't think so because you're really pushing this betaine pathway. So you might not see this unless you have some type of polymorphism going on in this pathway. Um, also, I, I do know this as well, that when the oxidative status of the cell gets way too high, like nitric oxide goes off the chart, then BHMT goes a little bit crazier, wants to protect the most important part of the cell, and it moves into the nucleus. And I think it's just, they're not really sure why it's moving in there, but it's enzyme activity goes down. So more likely it's in there trying to like stabilize membranes. Um, it looks like a membrane stabilizer per the article that I read. So um, the problem is, is that because it's really not doing anything, um, then you have a buildup of homocysteine um, and the homocysteine actually starts to homocystinolate the enzymes within the cell and the cell basically dies. So it's a really horrible cascade and it's kind of depressing um, because again, you, you can, once you become functionally B6 deficient, it's very broken because you can't make the things that would stop your oxidative stress. You're no longer going to be, be able to make glutathione. Um, you won't be able to make some sulfur. I mean, you know, there's like controversies about sulfur is bad for you. Sulfur is good for you. It has a role in the body. Um, so usually it's a sign of SIBO that you're not tolerating sulfur foods. Um, and then taurine. Taurine's super good at buffering retinal aldehyde and other aldehydes. And so that's important in this pathway. You want to be able to make that because whenever, um, whenever you have a large amount of sarcosine building up, your body if your body doesn't have the glutathione that's down here being made with B6 and your body um, doesn't have tetrahydrofolate, it can't detoxify the glutathione. I mean, sorry, it can't detoxify the formaldehyde and the formaldehyde contributes to the production of more nitric oxide. And so, um, but you're probably thinking, well, that's okay because I'll, I could take glutathione. Well, you still have to have tetrahydrofolate. So if you're not getting enough dietary folate, then you're not being able to make this um, tetrahydrofolate. Um, so that's important, having enough folate in your diet. And then um, also just might not be recycling folate really well. Again, because you get this B6 deficiency and you you downregulate this um, serine um, hydroxymethyltransferase. And then also retinoic acid, high levels of retinoic acid will downregulate that too. So there is so much going on in this pathway. And I'm not sure if this is helpful for people. You might have to watch the video more than once. So the underlying thing is like, how do we fix this? You know, how do we fix that? And that's what I'm exploring now, different options. Um, you do need to know that if you take glutathione, glutathione has a feedback um, inhibition on, um, on its own enzyme. And that's not shown over here. It's in another spot. Whoops. It's in another spot. Um, so over here, if you take, here's glutathione, GSH, if you take glutathione, it's going to come back and it's going to inhibit the enzyme that helps you to make it. Um, so the biggest thing I think is the most important to fix this functional B6 deficiency that I think is happening in a lot of people and it's going undiagnosed. I think it's betaine. I really think it is. If you aren't able to eat high betaine foods, if you're gluten-free or a low oxalate, then you need to one, first, go get a plasma amino acid test. Because one, you might want to know if this, this BHMT is up or like regulated. You know, it might be neat to see if you have high sarcosine levels. Um, you could confirm a potential diagnosis. Two, 
if you have a high methionine levels, very high methionine levels, I think it's like more than 500, uh, I don't remember the measurements, like micromoles or something, but there's a, I'll, I'll, under the video, I'll put a link to the journal article for that. But um, if you have high methionine levels and you start taking betaine, the combination causes brain edema. I don't want that for anybody. So I'm, I just do not think that you should supplement with betaine without doing a plasma amino acid test first. Um, probably supplementing with a normal dietary amount most likely is okay. Um, but again, what if you are one of those people that has a polymorphism, um, that slows down your CBS gene and that leads you towards upright, upregulating the pathway this way and you have high methionine levels. I just can't tell that we we're not, we're not able to tell that on people. So, um, yeah, so a normal amount of betaine in the diet would be between 250 and 500 milligrams of betaine a day. Um, the source that like you would use once you get this pathway figured out and you know that you're not risk at risk for brain edema would be trimethylglycine that would, or it's called betaine anhydrase. That would be the best choice. Um, and then you want to make sure that you get 250 to 500 milligrams of phosphatidylcholine a day. That's about two eggs a day, maybe three, depending on the size of your eggs. So two, about two large eggs. So, um, and some people again may need more, like with my clients who have liver issues, they typically respond better to three eggs instead of two, but I've just found this whole, um, betaine thing to be super significant for them. And so most likely we're going to adjust that. Um, as long as we can get that plasma amino acid test. So um, the clients that I work with are nonverbal and I am just not comfortable with potential brain edema and they won't be able to tell me. So um, I guess that's it. This was a longer video. Um, I hope it was helpful. And um, let me know if you have any questions or if you think I need to re-record it. <laughs> Thanks.